Hey YouTube, it's Aaron and it's always sunny in the shop. Today I went ahead and put together the uh, grinding class from the Bar Z Summer Bash 2018. I was lucky enough to be a part of the class uh, recording it. We've got Stig here, he uh, obviously cares about machine grinding. Um, so on uh, the Friday before the bash, because the bash is technically just one day, it's uh, the Saturday and this year uh, it was the uh, the last Saturday of June, or the second to last Saturday of June, and uh, I got to be a part of the bash, listening to Steve from Solid Rock Machine to uh, talk about grinding, his philosophy, things that work for him, things that don't work. Uh, it's a video that contains information about grinding wheels, about uh, machine prep a little bit, getting your chuck in the right position and set up correctly. There's all kinds of really good information. So I put, put all that together. We had some audio problems, so I tried to correct that the best I could. And um, anyway, so let's get right into it. This is Steve talking to the class on Friday before the bash about uh, uh, surface grinding. So hope you enjoy. We'll take something like this, and if it's a, uh, you know, got a bow, and what I try to do, I try to get the bow so it's like this. So that I'm hitting on the magnet here and here because if you got a bowl like that, uh, I got a holding point on the two ends. If you got your bowl going like this, well, you've got your tangent point here and it tends to spin a little bit. So if you grind here, it rocks a little bit. Really hard to get that bowl out. If you start with your bowl this way, you can take the majority of that bowl out real good. And then it's really flat, it's going to be a lot harder there. So the first thing you do is you get this the widest surface. Take your wider surface, get that flat, and get it parallel. And then you work every end over there, you work that off something square. So Stan has got this unit, and this has got a magnet on. And uh, what this unit is, this is all ground, flat, parallel, and square. And so he can set a part up over here, and if it's flat to begin with, he can, he can turn that on there. He can grind this side. He can grind this side, based off here, he can flip it up and grind that side. So he's got three sides. That will be as square as what his block, and based on his magnet, if the magnet's nice and square, it'll be perfect work when it comes out there. So now, if you have uh, this surface good, you have these surfaces good, now you can just set these up on your magnet, and then grind the other surfaces. Now you've got a flat, parallel, and square block, and it'll be flat, parallel, and square is what the tool that you use. So, so anyway, that's, uh, uh, when Stan showed me this, I've never used one of these, but I can instantly tell the principles that he's using, because that's what I use the cube for. And uh, uh, all the surface grinding equipment I have, I use that for just about everything. I got the little Toolmaker slices, and I got a very uh, precision one. I didn't grind that. I had a, when I first started the trade, I had some friends that had a lot of surface grinding experience. They ground that thing up and it just stayed good over the years. So there's some things where that shines, but the majority of the stuff I just use a cube. And uh, if you do make your own, I would recommend using a high quality material. At least an A2 is the minimum. Uh, but they got a new steel off called DC53. Uh, that stuff will have the strength of old one and it will have the wear resistance a little better than D2. So that thing will wear for a long time and be, be a better quality. So if you make your own tools, the high quality tool steel. Uh, and the other thing I always tell people, I'll spend a lot of time getting my personal tools in as close as I can because I know if I'm going to use those for grinding something like, you know, if I have a square block, if I want that to be square, I know it's, this is my weak point. If this is out of square, I'm going to struggle trying to get something. You know, you're going to be putting a little paint marker, shims, or whatever. If your tool's square, your magnet's flat, it's a piece of cake. It's downhill. So, anyways. A number of tools that you can use, and Stan has got a lot of them out here. This is just a simple spin in picture. It's not made, it's not intended for high accuracy work. So a lot of that stuff is pretty good. If you got to put something you want to put a simple square on it, you can put a 5 c collet in there, and you can index it, and it'd be cool for a lot of stuff. And I don't know if he has uh, uh, another spin picture. Uh, the spin picture you see in our video over here, that one's a little bit more precision. And it, it's still not as good as a lot of stuff on the market. Eric makes a, a alter next unit uh, that uh, <coughs> is very precision. And I've, I've ran them over the years. In fact, I use them so much. When they start wearing, I pull them apart and I rebuild them, put them back together. And I got down to where I could do that in about four hours. And uh, so 
So that that unit, uh, uh, when me and Adam started, that was close enough in town for about everything that we uh, were doing. It was motorized and, you know, to do. Uh, that unit there, if I build a stop unit where I could stop at certain index points, I could do stuff like that on the way. But, uh, so, so your tooling, your support tooling in your surface grinder, if you got a spin fixture, you got an air turbine uh, like that, I made that where I came out, you can do OD grinding, ID grinding, surface grinding all on one machine without a huge investment. If you look at trying to get an OD grinder and uh, uh, ID grinder, uh, even used ones, those things can get a real pricey right away. So, but anyways, your magnet. Uh, I think maybe some of you guys have seen uh, Stan's video where he takes those squares that's uh, got the lips on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he modified this magnet so he can set them down and grind. That was a very clever idea that he'd come up with. Again, your support tooling for what you're doing. Now, if you have one one set of squares you're going to do, I wouldn't cut a blaze off like that because it wouldn't be worth it, right? But like, yeah, he's making these things for production run. And, and now it's worth the investment of taking a magnet and cutting some slots in there and, uh, uh, you know, getting it for a specific purpose. Uh, these uh, granites, so those are more for your checking. They should be if they're, uh, you know, well done, the accuracy on these things. Uh, I, I've never really worked with the granites. I've used steel, some of our own uh, homemade stuff. But with a lot of these granites, they're probably a lot more accurate than what I have. They work great for checking your work. They work great. Uh, obviously, you're not going to stick this on the, the surface grinder magnet and drying. It's not going to stick. But for checking your work, uh, it's really important. So, so you got magnetic uh, sign bites, and this one, okay, well, it's not a compound. Sometimes you get a compound so that you can go one angle this way and another angle that way. It depending on the type of work you got. Things like this, man, they come in handy for a lot of stuff you can get. And uh, uh, the end mill sharpener, if you guys got milling machines and stuff, I've never used one of these. I've seen some of them used a lot. But uh, again, you got a surface grinder and you got a milling machine. You got, uh, you know, you put a diamond wheel in there, you can cut your uh, carbide wheel. You can just keep using the end mills over and over. If you have to make a kind of a modified uh, end mill, we've had it before. With some of the end mills that I'll bring, because these end mills, they, they, uh, a new one will taper in a degree or so, so that it's higher on this lip uh, than it is on that end. But if you're wanting to make a nice flat counter ball hole, it's not going to work. But you can set on these pictures, not even grind them flat, and give them a counter board. And again, it's just endless. Whatever your imagination, uh, whatever you can come up with and think. Uh, here's another tool that Stan's got. Uh, this is a nice unit. You don't see them used a lot, Dave. That's for form grain. Uh, that's when you want to put some nice radiuses on your wheel that blend up to an angle. And uh, we used to use those in the early days before hard turning. Uh, they'll put certain shapes on punches. And what you might have to do then is you'd have a, maybe you'd have a punch and on the top profile it would have a radius on the end that's held real precision. It'd come in and have another maybe an eighth inch radius that goes up to a 30 degree angle. And then at the 30 degree angle, it will have another radius, you know, 80 degree, come in on a flat step and up. And whatever the part you're standing, you'd have to match that. Up that before hard turning, this is how we would do it. You would dress that wheel in the key to try to get as many of those steps in there as you can. So if you have a radius and you have an angle, I can put both of those on there. I can cut that shape in the wheel. And then I can say, okay, now I got another angle and another radius. I gotta blend it, so then I change the setup so I can get the new radius, the new angle, and then you'd always have it so it's overlapping, you're using it, and you're coming in and you're waiting until you just barely touching that edge. So you can probably guess there's a lot of a lot of hoopses on there, and then you go back and, and get the other stuff. But, but this right here, uh, like I say, it's a really nice tool if you want to do precision angle, a precision radius, and just blend them in. And uh, the price and things, uh, I think it used to be about three grand, but because hard turning has taken that out a lot. Uh, there's a company, uh, I got my eye on one. Uh, uh, there's a company out by our house. He's got one of these brand new, the same brand name. Uh, he, I, I don't know if he still has it, but I'll have to check. He's the only man for about $800 because they just sell it on the shelf. Because hard turning is 
taking on that form drain, you know, and the place to go. So, yeah, you get a surface grader, you get your just different option tools. Here's another uh, pricing stand video. I've used these in the past. I love them. And Eric makes it. This is where you can grind between centers. And if you've got your centers lapped real good and they're good and precision, this is going to be one of the more accurate ways of grinding, OD grinding on the surface grinding. Uh, the spin pictures, like the one I have that showed on the video over here, there's about a one tenth, maybe a 50 millionth, it's about a one tenth total tick that I get in there, and it's based on the bearings. There's nothing I can do to take it out. Well, if I wanted to get past that, I could go to a unit like this, and in the future, I'm planning on making a unit similar to that that's motorized that it can do between centers. And the difference is I will do something with Robin Renzetti. Uh, we'll be uh, using some ceramic balls on the end that right in the center. So even if my uh, centers aren't real good and matching, I'm riding on a tangent point, it won't matter. It'd be even more precision. So just a lot of different things that you can use with the surface grinder. And again, just your imagination. So, and again, the variables, control the variables. The two biggest variables you want to control, especially at the beginning, is your wheel selection, and it's going to be your dining uh, dressing technique. Those are going to be the biggest. Now, who over here, if you want to get a real fine finish, who would know what kind of brick wheel you should start with? Just, just throwing out a question. Anybody have an idea of which, which, which your material looks like? Yeah, yeah. Well, like, let's just say you got a piece of old one that's kind of, kind of common, it's about 15, 60 Rockwell, and I'm wanting to get a good finish on it. Should I start uh, and finish it up with, say, a 220 grit wheel? Should I stay away from the 46 grit wheel? What grit wheel should I use for that? I get a video. Okay, <laughs> right now. Yeah. A lot of people, they think that the grit size is really key, and they think that Okay, I want a good finish, so I'm going to use a finer grit. That's not necessarily true. Uh, we've done a number of videos on there that you can you can see. I've got some pictures actually on the computer over here. You can't see it as good as you can see it live, though. But what happens is I can take a 46 grit wheel, and I can get it finished better than most people are going to get on a 150 grit wheel. What happens when you grind with a fine grit wheel, you've got to remember that gap between each little piece of grit is very small. So people generally will take a fine grit wheel and they'll use the grinding principles that they do on a coarse wheel. So if they're going to take off one or two thousandths and grind with a 46 wheel, they're going to try that with a 150 grit wheel or 220 grit wheel. Well, guess what? The cut you're taking is deeper than the pocket of the individual grit. Now you've got a lot of rub. And that's why when you, why do they got all these burn marks in here? Well, you got burn marks, you're generating heat, and guess what? It's in plate, and now you got a warped plate. The other thing that's different is if you've got a coarse wheel, 46 grit, that's my favorite, a big general all purpose wheel. If I use 80 inch wheels, they start with them. Once I take a diamond and I cut across there, all the high spots on the individual grit, they get cut so they're on the same circumference. So now I've got a lot of uh, area in between the pockets and the grit so that you can get your swarm. Your coolant and everything that can go in there. I got a lot of room. Uh, I got more air, so there's not as much rocket, and so I don't generate as much heat. I got a lot more control that way. So if I take a finer grit wheel, I'm cutting with a diamond, I got all the particles on the same circumference. But they've done actual papers uh, at some university where they uh, actually, their 46 grit will help perform uh, a better than a lot of other wheels that they're using that were 60 grit and higher, and it's because of those principles. Now, if you're using a piece of sandpaper, the grit size is going to matter because you're not cutting the high points of those grits off. So if you've got a 60 grit piece of sandpaper, you're going to have a rough finish. You put a 220 grit sandpaper, you're going to have a finer finish. That's when grit size is going to matter. In surface grinding, when you're truing the wheel out, you're cutting all those high points off. You're kind of, from your circumference around, you got the same distance on all that grit. Good. Yeah. Okay. Are we okay? It's hot and cold. Perfect. Okay. So, so again, it's all about wheel selection. One of the things I recently learned, uh, Radiac, I like those guys. They've been really good to me. Uh, they they will give me wheels to test and try.
right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, anyways, uh, one of the newer ones I've been trying is ruby rather than aluminum oxide. And I talked to some of the reps, and I said, man, I can't believe it. with the technique that I use of grinding uh, aluminum plate and getting a finish with this awesome on it. Uh, the rep says that the ruby wheels have got some extremely sharp cutting edges. And the way I was applying the coolant, just a straight mixture on the coolant, the combination of all the things that actually gave, I, it blew my mind the results I was getting. It wasn't me, it just, again, experiment and playing around seeing what would happen. And uh, so that's why I say, don't, don't be afraid to break the rules either. Just play around and experiment with it. So, so I, what I've learned is that these ruby wheels, they cut so much better and freer. And now the structure of the wheel, uh, I'm not sure Stan has a bunch of wheels, maybe we can find out how he's got them up here. Yeah, there's a rack. Uh, maybe later on we can pull some of these wheels off and you can see the structure. Um, you get a porous wheel and you can see great big old pits and stuff. You get a real fine structure wheel, uh, you know, you don't see all those groups. Type of grinding I do, that porous wheel. Uh, that Radiac made. I mean, I love that thing because I, I can finish real nice with it. I can rough real nice. I can do everything with it. But guess what? I had a project showing you where wheel selection is important. I had some pins for a company they wanted me to grind. They started out at 3 16 diameter and I would stick them in that spin picture and I had to grind them down to 150 thousandths diameter for almost two inches. I thought, well, I'm going to try this porous 46 grit wheel because it's porous and maybe I can get in there. I come down on the, uh, I come, uh, like if I'm going to start my spin pictures on this side, I always like to start this way and work that way. And uh, so I come down and I touch about a half thou off and I started grinding on that 46 wheel and I got proportionally about to this point and then you can hear that thing want to sing and the whole end of that was flexing around and oh, this isn't going to work. Radiac had a ruby wheel uh, that is a hundred grit, and I know I could get away with some stuff. And this one, uh, I can't remember what the porous construction was of. Anyhow, I took that wheel, I dressed it off, and it was a quarter inch thick wheel, so I dressed it. And then what I did for half of that wheel, I just went up about three thousandths and dressed up, so I only had an eighth inch of that wheel touching. I could take that three sixteenths pin, and I went uh, one point eight. Uh, grinding without any support and grinding a thousand per side at a time from 187,000 down to 150,000. It didn't sing. You could put a mic and it mics the same all the way up and down. The finish was awesome. That's the difference that you would have in your wheel selection for your job right there. And uh, uh, a lot of people ask, well, what are the fine wheels good for? That right there is what they're good for. You get a fine wheel, you get some structure like you had there where you you, with the fine wheel, you've got just thousands more cutting tips that are on there than that coarse grit. The coarse grit, uh, you know, you're, you're slamming into the part a little bit more. The fine grit, you've got a contact with the cutting edges, so you've got your, your preload on your part going across. It makes all the difference in the world. One of the things I want to do when I get back, I want to see how far I can go, what the limits is on that. And the reason I want to do it, not just out of curiosity, sometimes there's going to be jobs in the future that they might want to push that limit. So I want to know what they are, and then I may even bump up to 120 grit and see if I can get more. But there's there's just uh, some limits that you're going to have based on your diameter and your length rate ratios. The fine grit wheels that you have, the other thing that they're going to be good for too is when you get to them fine forms and bolt tight radiuses. If you got a 46 grit wheel and you want to grind up into a corner or something. Say if you're going to side wheel and you want to cut and you want a sharp radius down in this corner and use the 46 gear wheel, you're going to be lucky to get smaller than a 10,000 radius no matter what you do. And that's because your grip size is so big. So if you cut uh, on the side, you cut on the bottom, uh, you know, your grip size is going to determine what radius. You get a finer grip wheel, it's a smaller rock, and if I remember right, I think the general, uh, with a 220 grit wheel, I think you could get down if you're careful. I think they say about 2,000 radius that it will break down on there. And so if you grind most of that out and you come back and redress your wheel, I've already had it using under a comparator where we got it down to about 1,000 radius. 
So to try to get in that small detail, you'll never do that with a 46 screw wheel. So if you got a lot of roughing, rough it up with a 46, finish it up with a fine wheel. Uh, one of the other variables, let's see if we, we covered uh, wheel selection a little bit, dressing technique. Here's another common thing that you're going to see that you're going to experiment. You've got your Y travers in and out, and you've got your X travers. And uh, uh, it's kind of funny when I was uh, showing my kids how the surface grind. I've done this so much, I, I can just walk around and talk and not even pay attention because I'm just used to it. They've never done it, and they get up there and they're concentrating, they're trying to get the hand eye coordination. That's like patting your head and rubbing your belly. And that was just hard, and they'd be all laughing, you know, because of the fact that just they felt like they were really clumsy on it. So that takes practice, too. So if you're new at surface grinding, you think, man, I just can't get this rhythm. The key is don't give up. Keep practicing. It will come, and it gets to a point where you'll be able to just shut your eyes if you go and do it. So, so anyway, you get that rhythm down pat, and you got your Y travers that you're coming across your part, and you got your X travers. One of the common things that you'll see people think, well, I'm going to get a better finish if I go real slow on my x travers. Well, if you're grinding, you got some stock. Guess what? You introduce a lot of heat in your part then. And if you get the heat in there, then people say, why am I getting these burn marks? Well, you introduce heat in the part. I always try to get a real good, fast travers speed. If you get too fast, it's not good. Again, and you got to play around with it. you got to get the feel for it. But if you go slow, you're going to have a hard time getting some good, accurate work. I can tell you that right now. Uh, if you go too fast, your finish will probably suffer a little bit. So here's the thing, you can get most of your stock off, and if you're only going to tickle that maybe half a tenth, you can, you can probably slow your travers, you know, and uh, if you've got a surface grinder and the spindle cartridge is off a little bit, and you've got the, I don't know if you've seen the little ripples that you can get in your steel, and why doesn't that look good? A lot of times, it's either in the spindle cartridge, the bearings are off a little bit, or the coupling, if you've got a direct drive on your motor, there's a coupling that's going on there, and that, that's out of adjustment. Uh, we've already replaced that in my full-time job, a cartridge, no results, and then we'd have a guy come in and it'd be that coupling unit, or the bearings in the motor itself. So once you get that fixed, and this grind will make brand new again. So, so anyway, you can get that, it looks like a little ball team hammer, someone went down and just hit the surface on there. That could be... A, if you got bad bearings, bad coupling, no matter what you do, it's going to be hard to get that out. Uh, get that traverse in the, the X, like I say. Don't be afraid to play with that. And if anything, go faster than slower. Uh, you get the finer grit wheels and stuff, you're going to have to change your form a little, a little bit based on what grit wheel, what material you're cutting. Uh, all of that will play into it. If you ever cut D2, there's a lot of chrome in it. If you cut M4, M2, that's even worse than D2. Uh, where I work, they, they use so many different types of steel. If you get into the powdered metal steel, the CPM 1Bs, 3Bs, 15Bs, all that stuff's just about as hard as grinding the carbide. So, what kind of steels, first of all, you guys are, are you working mainly just O1s, aluminums, cast irons? And AP. And AP? <laughs> Believe it or not, no. is it hard or soft that you're working in? Okay. If you're going to grind soft cold roll steel, that is very difficult to grind and get a good finish. You know it, right? Yeah. I would much rather grind hard steel than soft steel because it comes off in the grinding a whole lot better. Uh, when you're grinding that soft steel, this is where that wheel selection and the coolant mixture that you make is going to be really key and important. What happens in uh, the little swarf, the little metal particles that you see in there? Uh, they wrap around the individual grit, and you can look under a magnifying glass, and it looks like you got these big boulders with a metal just wrapped around. Well, guess what? When that metal wraps around, you don't have a cutting edge now. You're metal on metal. And you're generating heat, you're getting a bad finish. If there's a little bit of uh, looseness in your bearing, you're going to see that vibration a little bit across there. So, grinding that soft steel, the general rule. The harder the bonding material for the softer steel, the softer the bonding material for the harder material. Those are the general rules. And again, they're all made to be broken to a degree. So, so if you're grinding soft steel, what I found even more important than the fact of, of the, on the wheel selection as far as the hardness, 
If, if you guys seen my video, you'll see I'll take straight coolant mixtures, undiluted, and I'll put a little can of it up there, and I got a brush, and I'll paint that material with it, and then when I come across, you will not believe the difference in the finish. I, I had a video, I had some knife makers. Yeah, yeah, they wanted to say, hey, I can't drain titanium. I'm having a hard time. Will you do a video on that? And I said, well, I've never even worked in titanium. I'm clueless, but I knew how that painted method worked on uh, uh, other materials. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to try. And of course, and then I knew from what I was reading, you're going to have to do the silicon carbide one. Well, I got my wheel selection, and even that, the people that are using the silicon carbide, they're having a tough time draining that titanium. And when I started working with it, I could tell that's the nasty stuff to work in. And uh, so, so anyhow, with that silicon carbide wheel, paint that coolant on there. The finishes I was getting off there, again, never working in titanium, just trying to use some principles I learned from all this stuff, seeing if they worked there. It worked out good. It was amazing. Now, we had a guy, I think, uh, I think if I remember right, I might be wrong, I thought he was kind of a chemist uh, off in Europe, and uh, he made a comment uh, why he thought putting that coolant on that titanium worked. And I think he might be right. I thought it was just kind of give him kind of a, like a hydraulic action in there, uh, you know, and keeping it so, uh, you know, when that uh, thick coolant's hitting in the pores of the material, I just thought it was smoothing things out. Plus, that stuff is super slippery. But he said, the problem with titanium, he says, when it starts getting heat put to it, he says, it's uh, got a low temperature where it oxidizes. And he says, when you got the titanium and the surface of that oxidizes, he says, that can get tougher than CDM and diamond. Well, you start getting in that, and you're wanting to cut that with aluminum oxide, I can see our silicon carbide, and I can see where it comes from. So his theory, which I think he might be right, when we're painting that coolant on there, he says what we're doing, we're preventing that surface from oxidizing. And again, it was just a beautiful finish, and it was by accident. And again, it was because of plate. I tried. Okay, this don't it, work. You made salt steel, like I said, or something like that, with undiluted coolant. Yeah. You still run your blood coolant? On that titanium, because that, that undiluted coolant, uh, coolant is hard to wash off. I ran my flood coolant to keep the heat up, and then I painted it on. And I know you can do that with 1018. Now, I got good results with 1018 and aluminum, aluminum with uh, aluminum oxide wheel, just painting that coolant on. But in the future, because I know it doesn't wash away, I'm going to run flood coolant and painted mixture, and I think I'm going to get the best of both worlds. So, so but that's a key. Uh, you talk to anybody that's got experience in grinding, they hate grinding soft steel. It's tough. It's, it's, it's harder than hard steel. So you use a few of these little tricks that'll help you out. So again, it's all about controlling the variables. And you're not going to know what variables to control until you start experimenting. One of the other things, you'll see I got popsicle sticks in the video. When you dress a wheel, there's always some loose grit in there. And if you ever uh, a ground uh, carbon electrodes for uh, EDM work, I can remember the first time I've done this, I'd be grinding this, I'd just dress the wheel, and there'd be all these little marks and lines. And I didn't know what's going on. I'd dress the wheel, and I'd get all these marks and lines in there. Well, I had a friend of mine, uh, Jerry DeBoer, I work with him now, and he worked uh, at a different place uh, before where they did a lot of that carbon electrode grind. He says, take a piece of hard wood. He says, uh, he says when you dress a wheel, you got loose particles. He said, you take a piece of hard wood, so it's not going to destroy your uh, uh, dressing mat, and you push that in there and then knock all those loose particles out, and then you won't get the scratches. Well, that's the first time I tried it, put a piece of wood to the ground, beautiful finish. Just little simple tips like that. So that same thing will apply on your cold roll steel, too. The softer materials, you got loose grit in your wheel, try to knock it out with a piece of hard wood. I, I've been getting you five times to try with some popsicle sticks. I think you had a piece of over or, or hickory or something like that, it might be even better. So but, uh, he actually would keep a piece of cold steel and just touch it on there. But, and then of course, then you have to take the chance of the support from the steel wrapping around uh, your individual grit, which is on the wood you won't have that problem. And it will make a big difference if you're going for finish. So, what's the best steel to work in or work on? Oh boy, that's a good question. Now, I guess a lot of it's going to be determining what you want to grind. And, from my experience, I think maybe, uh, do you know if this could be hard steel or soft steel you're going to be working in? Well, I wouldn't be kidding. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, yeah. 
Bible trait, uh, you know, old one, uh, you can practice on that. It's not that cheap. It's a very common steel. A lot of people use it. Uh, and, and you're not going to have to worry about the wheel loading up so bad on it or glazing over. Uh, and and that gives you some good general practice. Get it about 58, 60 Rockwell. If you try to take a piece of D2 and expect it to grind the same as that O1, you're in for a surprise. It's not going to, that stuff's hard. And like I say, because of the chrome content in it, it's a whole different feature. And that's why I say it's all about wheel selection and some of these techniques. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if you're driving soft steel, uh, play with the different hardnesses. Uh, I use a, a 46H wheel, the H, I, J, K on your wheel designation. The closer you get to Z, the harder that wheel is. The closer you are to A, the softer that bonding material is. And so the hard steel, uh, so it's always sharp. And so what they want is that, uh, as you're coming across, they want it to break away. If you have too hard of a bonding material, and you're coming across the wheel doesn't break away, and then what happens is the cutting edges dull up, and as they dull up, now you're starting to wave. Hey, that looks good for this bar, but it's all got burn marks in this this part. Well, it's because your wheel's not breaking away. So that's that right there is one of the keys where you can say, hey, I need to change the hardness. It looks good in the first half, the second half suffers. Change to a softer wheel. See what happens. If you're in full roll and stuff, what's going to happen is that swarf in the softer wheel is going to collect around the wheel, and, and it's just going to not work as good. But I think it's more forgiving in cold roll than the hardened steel because uh, when I do the cold roll, uh, the aluminum, I'm using the uh, eight wheels too. I don't have a huge selection of wheels. Uh, next time I buy wheels, I'm going to have to buy one with a harder bonding just to play with it and see what happens again and, uh, and see if it lasts even longer. So, so anyway, yeah, the softer cold roll steel, go so maybe with a, a J or K wheel. Maybe even a little bit harder. If you're in D2, you definitely go down soft. Get one of them porous wheels because you're going to generate heat. And everything that keys in is you want to keep the heat out of the part. Do everything you can. Flood it with coolant, and, uh, and that's where you're going to have the success. Now, there's a difference because I just kind of hit it on it. And it's important to know when you're grinding with the wheel, there's two things that will happen on that wheel. It's either going to load up with the swarf wrapped around the rocks, or the individual cutting edges, depending on what the steel the wheel got, they're going to dull over. I call it glazing. Uh, it glaze over. So each one of what is going to have one, you got dull rocks, well, the dull grit, when you cut, and it's going to make noise. Maybe some of you heard when you got a bad wheel and you're grinding, uh, and that thing's singing. When it sings, you don't want to list. I mean, that, that singing to you is not good. You want that to cut real nice. So a glazed wheel and a loaded wheel, they'll sound identical. One way you can see if you got a nice scope like Stan has over here, you can look, and if you got a loaded wheel, you can look under there and see the individual swarf, the metal particle wrapped around your rock. If it's a glazed wheel, there's no metal in there. Then all the rocks, instead of being sharp, they're all tall and rounded. So knowing this little bit right here, is my wheel loading or is it going? Is it glazing over? That will tell you what wheel you need to switch to. And uh, so if you're in a harder steel and it's not loading, but you know, you're halfway across and it starts burning and it starts singing at you, go to a softer wheel. You know, if you're in cold roll and it's soft and you're coming across there and all of a sudden you get all that, uh, you know, bad finishes on it, go ahead and try a, 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 a harder material, see if that works. But in cold roll, what I would do, Especially this up, get that straight coolant. That, that right there is going to make a world of difference no matter what other variable. That right there will be the most important one. Uh, you'll be amazed at the difference on the finish you're going to get by just applying that little technique. Uh, and I mentioned to a lot of people, uh, like say the two most important variables for me would be that the wheel selection and the dressing. Now those, those are key. Get that down pat, that will compensate. Back to the, the dressing of the wheel, uh, it will compensate for a lot of other variables that you might have missed. Uh, how many of you people have balanced wheels? I know Randy's got some videos on it. <laughs> okay, and here's the thing. Uh, a lot of people probably be surprised. I, I've only balanced one or two wheels in my life. And the reason is, is because the shop that we're working in, we're swapping wheels all the time. 
if I had to take and balance a wheel and you're a job shop and say, hey, I got I got 60 bucks, we got 60 bucks, and it's gonna take me 45 minutes to balance my wheel, I just shot up on my pocket. So we got a wheel balancer right here. And, and that, that, there's many styles that you have out there. Your 8 inch wheels and under, if you even talk to the manufacturer, there's a lot of debate whether you even need the balance wheel. Uh, I, think, I think if you're going for the ultimate finish, you want it to look nice, I'd balance the wheel. But if I got a finish that I'm satisfied with and I know I'm going to be changing my wheel, it's just not economical if you're in the job shop operation. Uh, Otherwise, then you can buy dozens of these hubs. But those hubs are about a hundred dollars a piece for a good one, you know. So, so if you want to have 10, 15 wheels that are dressed on their hubs, now you've got a lot of expense just hanging on the wall. And guess what? When you got aluminum, aluminum oxide wheel, you got to start out with an eight inch wheel, and you got that balance. You grind it down to a seven inch. You better take it off and balance again because just the density, it's not even all the way across there. So as you go to a different diameter. Then the balance is going to change. So when you're balancing the wheel, I think a lot of people are under the perception I'm going to get the ultimate finish. I can tell you this from my experience that proper dressing is going to do more for you than balancing the wheel. But if you want the ultimate finish, get that dressing down and balance your wheel. If it's economics and the customer's happy with the finish, don't go with what's going to put more money in your pocket. You know so. And again, another variable that you can have, and there's different ways, and you'll see there's a lot of YouTube videos uh, that people are using with balancing. Uh, Randy, you had uh, we did some grass shims on one of your videos. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, you have uh, the wheels I have that got the weighted segments. Now, now here's something else. When you got the weighted segments, here's something else. Even if you're grinding with that wheel and the density is in, guess what? If you ever pull that wheel off and you look at the back of that wheel, you're going to see a dirt build up on all of those different. Things. If you've got a higher buildup on one pocket, then oh, guess what? You will go to balance. Well, instead of balance with dirt, lay it all out, get it all, put it out, and you'll be close to it. So balancing, again, for that ultimate finish, uh, it, it's good. If you're wanting to put money in your pocket, it's going to be hard, hard to do balancing every wheel. If you've got to do that often, I would suggest buying hubs, balancing the wheel, and not taking that wheel off until you're changing that wheel off. And like me, I got I got two or three hubs, and if I have to balance every wheel, I'd never get any work done. Uh, Ultramogo grinder, awesome grinder. Uh, that uses a 12 inch wheel. We don't even balance there, but that would be probably the place where you want. But the wheel manufacturers, I got this down pat so good uh, that I don't think it's as important as what it used to be. You know, I think they're a lot closer. I think they got the density and the bonding I, I, and everything. You get the technology. I think. It, I don't think it's as important today as what it is, but again, it's all what you're going for. I mean, I think though, if, if you put a wheel on, you know, just take the wheel, new, put it on the hub, throw it on the sheet, dress it. If you have any kind of vibration, though, don't don't continue. Yeah. And, you know, change the change the rotation of the, yeah. uh, of the wheel because there is some play in those uh, the wheel on the, on the hub. Move it. Do something. Because if you have a noticeable vibration, yep. you don't want to grind with that. Yeah, you, you know, no matter what you do, you're not going to get good results. Right, you've got to do something about it, whether it's a balancing or just rotating the wheel on the hub or something. But do something. Yeah. If it's not noticeable, then yeah. you know, go with it. But, and what Randy just you know, pointed out, that's probably the key right there. Put the wheel on, dress it up so that you got just a general uh, circumference that's good. And then feel the machine. If there's excessive vibration and you want to do something else, and it may be, maybe it's just on the side. Maybe you just need to dress some of the, the imbalance on the side. You might have to balance the machine. But you, you'll feel if there's vibration in that machine and it's unbalanced, you're going to feel it. I don't know if you explain. I, I've got to it. You know, when, when, you're, when it's vibrating or when it's imbalanced, the, the wheel is not in constant contact with the work, is what it is. It, 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 it may be 80% of the wheel is in contact, and then there's a gap. There's a gap. Every time it's within five or 6,000 RPM, gap, 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 and that's what causes the vibration. It's that loss of contact of the work. So, you know, if you have a noticeable thing, maybe only 20% of the wheel is touching. That yeah. comes around. You know, ching, 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 yeah. you know. So, 
Well, now Randy's bringing up another point because this is something that's common that you see. When you're grinding and you can tell that only a portion of the wheel's hidden, the time I see that most time is when you put a brand new wheel on and someone doesn't dress enough material off it to get it right. There you go. Right, right there. That's there, when you there, see it the most. They only want to take off 2,000. Well, take off 10. Yeah. And make sure the wheel is eccentric. Exactly. Right. And that's what it's about. Yeah. Well, these are just some fundamental tips, but they're important. And the success of your grinding, the more of these little details that you can control, uh, is, is going to make your success. I look at it as kind of making a recipe. If I'm going to make some of my famous hot chili, I don't start out with a couple blueberries, right? You know, I'll get some nice hot chili peppers, you know, and get some nice meat. You've got to get the recipe right to get the end result you want. And so, so any project you've got to come up to, you've got to think, okay, what is my end result? You're going to be working in cold roll. Your wheel selection, uh, dressing techniques are going to be based on what your end result. Do you want flat, parallel, and square? You know, that's where you're going to have to decide, okay, what wheel's right for the job. And we haven't even got into super braces and stuff. And that can get expensive, but then super braces, they're awesome. And the thing that, uh, have you ground with super braces like CBN? Has yeah. anybody here ground with CBN or diamond wheels? I had a diamond wheel. Okay, and what did you grind with? Did carbide. You, okay, yeah, you're going to, exactly, carbide. Carbide, if you grind carbide, you're going to use diamond. Do not use CBN on carbide. You'll tear up a wheel in a heartbeat. Now, your CBN wheels, they're expensive. Back, uh, I used to own a different shop. It was a solid rock tool and gauge. I was in partnership with a, a friend, and the partnership didn't work out, and so it kind of dissolved. We used to use a lot of the uh, super abrasive, the CBN. And we had, I'll try to describe this, but we... Uh, we had these units where we had to make these blades that had a radius. So I would make an arbor with the slot, four slots, and we could bolt down two blades, two blades, two blades. So there were rectangle blades, and we had to grind a radius on there. So with this picture, I could grind eight blades at one time. Well, it was production work, and we had to have a way where we could drop that wheel down, grind across there, get almost all that stock off one pass, come back and finish. Well, the aluminum oxide wheels I was using at the time... Uh, when I tried to grind like that, uh, it just was not working. And so I talked to a manufacturer. I won't say their name because it's not their fault. They make some of the best CBN out on the market. It's the way I'm trying to use it. But he assured me, after paying $500 for this nice super abrasive wheel, that this thing would cut these things left and right. So I got that wheel in. I couldn't wait to try it. I got my spin fixer set up. I dropped down, and I'm taking off like 60 thousandths, and I'm coming down. I'm going to come across. Now, uh, yeah, that worked pretty good. Then I looked at my super brace of wheel. There's a 15 degree angle, all worn on there. And I thought, well, at $500 a wheel, I'm going to give up 30 parts, so I'm going to have to spend another $500. I'm not going to make money that way. <clears throat> we had, and again, I was fretting over this a little bit and worried, what am I going to do? We're committed to this customer. How are we going to get this? We happened to have, right after using that wheel, uh, a salesman from Radiac that stopped in. That's when I really got into the Radiac wheels. And that's when they first had these uh, uh, wheels that were the porous construction and they had a ceramic mix. And I was showing them what I'm doing. He says, here, I'm going to give you a free wheel. Try that. Man, I popped that out. And after about 30, 40 blades, not even dressing that thing off, that thing was cutting. I've been using them things ever since. So here I got a $500 super abrasive, but because I was using it wrong, I was destroying the wheel. And I dropped back down to about, at that day, I think it was $35 for an aluminum oxide ceramic mix wheel. And, I mean, it just cut like you wouldn't believe. And uh, so, again, that's the importance of your wheel selection for your job. In this case, one of the elements we didn't introduce, interrupted cutting. Uh, another element we I didn't talk about, okay, I got 60,000 stock or more I got to take off. Do I take that off at a 1,000 at a time? It's going to take me all day. You'll find out that if you... Got 60,000 from like that case, drop her down 55, just whip her across. It will, it will be, it'll be cool to the touch. If you take that a thousand at a time without cooling, you touch with your fingers, you're going to have a blister. So, so, you know, just a lot of those little techniques like that, and you just experiment around with a lot of it. Or uh, if you're on our YouTube channel, I've had, I don't know how many people here in the last six months, they contacted me. Uh, and they said, hey, I got this project, and the last one was with chipper blades, and he's having a hard time getting a good finish on there. And I haven't heard back from them yet, but 
uh, you know, he, they tell me I'm having a hard time with my finish or it's not cutting right. Well, that's a starting point, but I'm still clueless. So I'd have to write back, okay, what are you cutting? What wheel are you using? And I'd have to get all the details, and then when I can get that, and then I can use some of the stuff I've learned over my years, and so far, uh, it's been working out pretty good, you know. And if it's something I don't know, like I had some knife makers say, hey, how do you grind titanium? I don't know. I bought a piece of titanium, I played with it. And uh, so, well, now if I ever have to grind it, I don't know how to do it. But, uh, so anyhow, I'm willing to experiment on some of that stuff because of my own natural curiosity. So if you get a project, you're struggling with it, don't be afraid to send us an email. And I'll, I'll try to help. I might be able to uh, get you a better start, and I might have to learn just like you guys. Maybe maybe together we can learn something that'll work out. But uh, again, it's wheel selection, variables, and as you grind, uh, you, 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 you start, okay, I learned this by grinding this old one, using this type of wheel. How will it apply here? Let's try it. A lot of it's just don't be afraid. Don't get locked in. Someone says, okay, you always got to use a K hardness on Cobo. You can never change. Don't ever get locked into that. Uh, everybody's got an opinion about everything, and you don't live according to other people's convictions. You live by your convictions, right? And so you say, okay, you might be right. You've got a lot of knowledge, but I'm going to try. And you'll be surprised. The, probably the biggest failure that you have in the machining world in general is people giving up without pushing the envelope and trying. Don't be afraid to just keep going and pushing the boundaries and trying. I got a question if you mind uh, on dressing a diamond wheel. Uh, any offer <laughs> good suggestions? <laughs> 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 Very difficult to do. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I watched your video. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you watch my video, oh, I, I was know. asked that way too. Well, I know. It's all new to me, and I'm yeah. telling you, so one of the first things I do, you go to the Oracle. Uh, you do a Google search. <laughs> it knows everything, yeah. you know? And then you look, and then, and here's the thing, though. But you got to remember, everybody's got an opinion. So you might have a lot of people saying this, and they're not even close to the ballpark. But if you don't know, you might have to try. But then you're going to find a few of the gyms where, oh, this person, he's been down that road. He's done it. He's got it down pat. When I'm doing some search on grinding or dressing a diamond wheel, I had a hard time. Now, does anybody know what a, a brake tool is? Okay. And it's basically a little unit that's got this small, what, about five-inch wheels, I guess. Uh, they're about one-inch thick. And, and they'll use them. Uh, you set them up on your magnet. I'm just uh, pretend this is uh, your surface. You set them at a slight angle. You got that, that little eight-inch wheel on there, and you try to have the brake tool set so that when you touch the wheel, it will spin it for you. Now, if you can afford the money, if you can get a motorized brake tool, that's the way to go. But here's the thing: when you use that brake tool, you better have a lot of wheels because if that diamond goes, you're going to burn through a lot of wheels because it does not come off fast. You're cutting, and you're going to have a lot of that abrasive material that's uh, going on there. One thing that I found, and I wish I would have brought one, I don't know if Stan has any. Uh, you've probably seen those white sticks that I use for uh, the white abrasive, or the, uh, the abrasive hard wheel. I tell you what, those things when it comes to super abrasive, they're diamond and whatever, they're weight, worth their weight in gold. Because what will happen, you can use that brake tool and you can go across and uh, like at my full-time job, they do a lot of carbide grinding, and it's not uncommon that they might have 10, 15 thousandths difference from one end to the other that you've got to have flattened out. <clears throat> We'd use that brake tool, and I thought, man, this is going to take all day. We don't have enough wheel. Taking those aluminum oxide sticks, I buy the 8-inch long, uh, 1 inch by 1 inch, and they're the soft material. Remember, the softer material is good for your harder materials. These are A. And what you want to do is you want to use a smaller grit in that stick than whatever diamond. I had a 150 grit diamond. I made the mistake of buying a whole bunch of 150 grits and I bought two 220 grit. Well, guess what? The grit in the 150 is the same size as the grit uh, that I have on the diamond, so I can't get in there and clean that resin out behind each diamond, which you have to have that cleaned up. So the 220 sticks, if that's what I'll buy in the future, I can use a smaller grid. It can get in there and then it'll create a pocket in that resin behind the diamond so you can get your swarp and everything coming and exposed cutting edge. So you want to use a finer grid than whatever uh, diamond you have set up. 
They, I would take in uh, at the full-time job I was though, I'd use that truing tool and I could say, oh man, there's a big angle because you can see right away with that, that truing tool, you can see where it's touching the wheel. And then I, I thought, okay, I'm going to take one of those uh, white stick wheels. If you use them dry, they're extremely aggressive. So if you're going to rough things down, you take it while it's dry and you just push in at the spot that's low, the place where you want to take material. You push it. You can use that braking tool. Come across and see how much you gain. And then you can go over there and hit the high spot. Pretty soon it's going to be pretty flat all the way across there. And then you can finish it off with that truing tool, which isn't going to take that much off. You just take about five tenths at a time and work it back and you can get a wheel. Now, I didn't have a truing tool. And I wanted to make some of these uh, uh, big stones that Robin Renzini that's famous for, if you've seen some of his videos, uh, uh, he turned me on to them, and again, maybe, I'm going to need to stop right here, but if you're in the surface grading, them stones are worth their weight in gold. Uh, it's amazing. Oh, one of the things that you're going to have, and the biggest use I have, if you just take one of them fine Indian stones, and you've got little nicks in your magnet, and you start using one and wiping it down, you're cutting surface when you're rubbing that. Pretty soon you're grinding your magnet again because you've got low spots, high spots in it. Uh, those stones that Robin has, you can buy them, they're about $16, $17 on sale from MSC a lot of times. If you've got a good grinder, a good diamond wheel, uh, Robin's got a whole video that he can show you how to grind these, and you can grind these. And so what happens, now you've got a flat surface, you don't have individual grit sticking up. And no matter what you do, you're not going to take geometry off. But if you've got a bump in there, it will shave it off like a fine razor. And you can't find a better tool to have if you're a surface grinder and wanting your magnet to stay good. Uh, before using Robin Stones, every three to six months I'm taking my grinder and I'm redressing uh, the magnet to get it flat. I don't think I've touched it in a year. You know, so, and, 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 and you can see it. And, and the nice thing, because it doesn't remove geometry on there, it just removes the high spot. The more you use it, the better the magnet gets too. So, so if you haven't seen Robin and Zinni's video, I'd encourage you to look at that. Uh, I think he's going to offer, if I remember right, to sell those when he gets that new surface grinder that he's rebuilding up and going. I don't know what the cost is. Contact him. But they're worth their weight in gold. Going back to the super abrasive, though, with the white stick, <laughs> I didn't have a truing tool. I had to get that diamond so I could grind some of those uh, stones I was just telling you about. I had to get it flat. The best I could find on the internet was that people were using soft cold rolled steel somehow. They didn't explain how. That threw them diamonds up. So I thought, well, time to experiment. Let's see what we can do. I started off by just coming down a thousandths and dressing and dressing and using the white stick to clean some of the swarf out. And this was going to take forever. So then I just started plunging on it, figuring the high spot will be hit. And I can see the high spot hitting the white stick. And, and, and so I, uh, what I had when I mounted the wheel, there's always a little play in the wheel. So the thing that I had to get up most, uh, if you have... Uh, an indicator, and you want to indicate the trueness of your diamond wheel. If you put your carbide tip and you're grinding with diamond on that well, guess what? You're going to have a flat on that grinding tip. So, one of the tricks, I don't know whose YouTube channel it was, but I thought it was very clever. They put a piece of paper between the wheel and the indicator tip, and then they can turn it, and then you can see the movement without damaging the carbide tip. And I, I can't remember who it was, but that was an excellent tip. So I've learned so much just from the YouTube university out there too myself. So don't be afraid to look at some of that stuff that's just a little golden nugget. So anyhow, it was running out about two thousands. I didn't care. I didn't care if the surface was straight at that point or not. I had to get the, the circumference running through. So what I ended up doing, playing around with it, I took a piece of block of coal steel, put it on the magnet, and I dropped that wheel about an eighth of an inch down below the surface. I was guessing that the cold roll, what they did, by hitting it and grinding it hard, that the, the, the swarf would wrap around the diamond particles and pull it out. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I'm guessing was happening. I thought, well, I'm going to try this. And I'm either going to blow up this nice diamond wheel or I'm going to get it flat. One of the two things are going to happen. So anyway, I flooded it with coolant, and I would hit and I wouldn't bump it real hard. I just I just put kind of a steady pressure, and I wouldn't have to go very uh, deep in. And and it worked. Pretty soon it was round. So now the wheel was round on the circumference, 
that there was a flat. So now how did I get the flat out? Well, then that's when I, I just started going down on about a thousands come across and getting it lower, and it was taking forever. That's when I grabbed out the white stick. And now, now that I had the circumference, I could take a piece of coal and I could grind across it, and I can see where the high points are. I just take that stick and I would hit it in the high spot, come back, grind, and, and it worked good. And then when I had a nice finish on the part where it's nice and flat, and when I got my final product, I could just move over to the center of the wheel, line down the tent, ink it up. And if I had that whole half inch wheel where it was taking off that material and that half inch uh, uh, distance, I knew by an indicator I was wrong, and I knew because it took off that ink with the one tenth, I was flat within one ten thousandth of an inch. So that's how I've done my diamond wheel, and it worked pretty good. And I got those stones ground out really good. And so again, it was just experimenting uh, a little bit. Again, going doing an internet search on it, starting there, seeing what I, I could do. Good What's that? So it just sounds like this would make a good video. Yeah. And, uh, they're, 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 again, I'm, uh, you got the kind of number of guys here that uh, you can do. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Don't be afraid to check it. So our friend in Sacramento, Bobby, he got a service grinder. He got a little diamond wheel off of uh, AliExpress from China, you know, and then he ground a set of stones like Robin did. Yeah. He was out the epoxy, of course. But, so then he kind of invites, since he was all set up, we all kind of went over and started grab, grinding our stones over at Bob's house. Well, by the end of it, after about seven or eight people each did, you know, two or four stones, it really seemed like that wheel was working a lot better. That's the experience we had, too. Uh, because what's happening is, uh, because of the stones there, they're, they're taking a little bit off, throwing it up. I had the same thing. I had, uh, uh, I think we ground five or six sets. I uh, doing a set for Adam, doing a set for myself. Uh, I have this friend that's in machinery building. This guy is awesome. His name is Daryl Smith. He's semi retired, that guy can fix anything. I mean, uh, but uh, he, he gave me some big suburban angle plates and I felt indebted to him a little bit. So, and I know because of what Robin was talking about, he says the stones when you're scraping, uh, they're just awesome and this guy's big and scraping. So I made a set of stones for him. I had a co-worker, uh, he'd just been through the apprenticeship program, but this is one in a million, uh, his name's Jonathan. Uh, we got some videos with him and here, here you very rarely are going to see the raw talent that you're going to see with a guy like John, Jonathan. At the age he is, if he keeps going at the rate, there's no doubt in my mind he's going to be one of the best tool maker machinists that was ever out there. I mean, the guy is awesome. I can't uh, tell you enough. I mean, uh, he's taken little projects that we worked on together, and he's even carried them way beyond what I was even thinking of. He's got that mindset right now. And that, that's the thing you want, it's, it's, it's a mindset that you have to have when you come to this, you know. Uh, you want to you wanna do uh, your machining, whether it's grinding or not. It's all about troubleshooting. You say, okay, I'm grinding, I got a problem. First, you got to identify your problem, and then you... Sorry, sorry guys, no sorry, sorry, sorry. Once you identify your problem, and then you got to get you a list. What are the most likely reasons that I'm having this problem? And then you go through, and, and, and you, okay, here's fix number one. Did it work? Hopefully it did, and then you're good to go. If not, then you go down to number two, and then number three. Somewhere down the line, by the process of elimination, if you can't fix the problem, I'll tell you one thing, man, you're going to learn a lot that you can apply to other jobs. So, But yeah, we've got the same experience, though, that when you have the more of those blocks that we ground, the better that diamond will go. And, and what we did, uh, and it, I don't know if you guys are in the same way, we would rub Just the wheels in. out, the, the wheels yeah, a half yeah. inch, and so instead of coming all the way down and coming across, we'd come over a half inch, and we would uh, plunge grind straight down to what we need. We'd bring it back up, we'd come over an inch, and the whole reason on that is to keep that diamond wheel flat as it weird, and come over and plunge down. And it's only on the finished passes that we'd start over here, wind a few times, and then come across. That's how we did it. Yeah, and yeah, we got the same results. The more we did, the better, better finish, the better the diamond wheel was. So. So, so take one stone, put it on there, and just grind a little bit like that. And, there you go. And then finish grinding all the rest. Yeah, there you go. So, really, I mean, they, they, the stones are cheap. Yeah. You know, grind, grind the hell out of one of them. Yeah. And then uh, they come in and do the one you want to do. Yeah. I mean, stones, stones, are stones are awesome. Really? Oh, they are. Because I said, I ground like Chuck, and then I, you know, like you said, I got the little regular stone before we did the grinding, and it was like attacking a thing with a piece of sandpaper. Yeah, yeah. You know, but the, the ground stones, they don't, they only take the high spots. They don't yeah. Attack. So when you got your own personal tools that you want, sometimes you get a little mix in there, 
you, you can take and you can hit that with some stones too, and knowing you're not going to remove geometry, but you're going to take the defects, the high point. And, and uh, again, I, I, I can't even put a value on them stones, that's how good they are. I never heard of them until I watched Robin's video, and I went, what is this guy doing? And most of the stuff I do, I traverse both ways, especially roughing. Because uh, when, when you're draining, uh, the typical job shop that I've worked in, they leave between seven and 15,000 grain stock. If your work is good and square, if you have a square block and your work after heat treat and a little bit of distortion, if you do a good job, you could get away with seven thousandths stop. But if, if you start out and it's five thousandths difference everywhere, you're going to want to stay maybe fifteen thousandths. It depends on uh, the shape of your equipment, you know, for squaring stuff up, how, how good you're at it getting it square. I always try to get my stuff flat, parallel, and square the best I can so that the grinding process is easier. Uh, because if I got to grind, say, 10 to 20,000 stock off every part, that means that I'm dressing the wheel more often. That means that if I got excessive stock, uh, I'm going to rough it down. I'm going to have to dress the wheel out before I do a finish cut if I want it. But if I got 7,000 stock and it cleans up right away, I can a lot of times get away with my one dress to do the rough and the finish, depending on, you know, what I need. If I got a lot of stock, you're almost all the time going to be dressing more, which means you're using up more wheel. It's all kind of just different techniques you have. But if your block can't come out very square, you're going to have to have more stock to, to start with. And uh, so but, uh, we just asked about grinding the magnet. Uh, a lot of people don't realize grinding the magnet on the surface grinder, it's not that easy. You've got soft material, uh, you know, different makeup, some aluminum and brass and some just total steel and brass. So it's soft material. And so you're going to have that swarf problem getting in, in, in uh, your wheel process. And so all the years that I've been grinding, I focus on the parts like the magnet. I never rush it. Because everything I do off that magnet is going to be conditioned, as far as the accuracy, it can be conditioned on how flat that magnet is. I want to spend the time. Uh, you'll see some, sometimes people are trying to get a super nice finish on that. I don't care about the finish. I want it to be flat. That's the key. The finish, you can have the, a mirror finish on that thing. The first few pieces of steel you put on there and pull off, you're going to have lines in it anyhow. So, so when you come to a magnet, don't be too concerned about the finish you want in flatness because everything you set on there, uh, if your magnet isn't flat, it's not saying you can't get good square stuff off, but you're going to work at it a lot harder. The better your magnet is, the easier your graining job is going to be. I noticed when I was working with my magnet in, I was doing a quarter inch step over, which was half the width of the wheel. Yeah. And I got better accuracy doing that than like a 50,000 step over. Yeah, and again, it depends on what wheel. Uh, now, the wheel that, that I use that I like for dressing the magnet uh, has been the same now for decades. If you've seen some of our videos, it's just a regular white aluminum oxide wheel. I always want to start out with an 8-inch one. I don't want to grind the magnet with a 6-inch wheel. And the reason, now there's a difference of opinion. People say, well, your surface footage on an 8-inch wheel is higher than what you need to be. But guess what? An 8-inch wheel I got a thousand more cutting edges than I do on a six inch wheel. So there's give and take here. I'd rather have the cutting edges rather than the proper speed. So, so like I said, you get a six inch wheel, I get halfway across my magnet, now the wheel's loaded up, you know? So, so anyhow, when you start out grinding your magnet, one of the things that you want to do is you never want to let your magnet get to the point where it's excessive wearing in there. Uh, one of the things, you can't get away from it, a lot of times if you've got a block on here and it's sticking real tight on the magnet, you want to try to break the part off rather than pulling it off. If, you, if you've got coolant mixed with your grinding grit and all the contaminants in it, and you slide off here, it's just like running sandpaper across there every time. Pretty soon you're going to have a wear spot, and that's what you see common in a grinder, is a wear spot like that that, that you actually got to work out. Uh, if you can get in some good habits, in, in thinner plates is hard, but if you can crack it, kind of break it, and then pull it straight up, you're going to have to spend less time grinding the magnet. If you let that get excessive, where you got to take two or three thousandths off, well, then you, you're just going to be spending a lot of time. The best case scenario, when I grind a magnet, 
to get it to the tolerances that I want, where I'm happy with it, I spend a minimum of an hour, between one and two hours. This is going to be a really stupid basic question, but my little surface grinder that is not equipped to, to not have plug in here. Okay. And it just set up, I possibly could put the PS on it, okay. uh, but uh, it has no catch basin or anything like that. Okay. What if, I mean, you seem to be recommending always using a little bit of Yeah, right. If, if you're going to use high precision work, you're going to need a coolant based system. Now, this is a grinder that you'll be able to maybe fabricate a little uh, uh, holding tank around. I mean, because you can just get a, a five gallon bucket with a nice little pump in there that, I mean, even that will work. You know, and you can use one of those filter socks in there to catch all the return, and so you can keep your coolant clean. I can use the coolness setup. On okay, mine. but even that, after I'm done doing something as big as the uh, yeah. the truck, I've used at least a pint of liquid. So yeah, yeah. Hey, well, that's in the air. <laughs> you you can grind without coolant, but to get the precision, I mean, I'm talking. Split and tense now, mm -hmm. it is going to be extremely hard. On that little cube that I have, when I'm trying to grind something, uh, and I don't like to use coolant because I got all these screw holes on there. Uh, and if you ever have a cube, you, you can blow for a day on that uh, cube and set it up with still the coolant. So I try to grind dry on that, but generally I know that I'm going to end up with maybe about a 50 million volt. So uh, what I'm doing at that point, I'm just trying to get the edges square. And I know I'm going to have a little bit of bowl, but when I flip, let's say if I'm grinding something like this, I'll end up with a bowl in the middle. It's always too low. Then it'd be so minute, it's always good this way. I can then take it off here, set that, run flood from it, grind that, and then flip it back over. And that's the easiest way to take out, and then it's super flat. But, uh, but as far as grinding the magnets, what you want to do is you want to get that cool, get a nice fresh wheel. I take them a little sharpie markers and I, I, I mark it all up so I can see my low spots after my first pass. And where I'm going to touch off, I'll mark up and I'll come over there and I, I don't even want to take more than a tenth at a time when I'm coming across it. If you take too heavy of a cut, uh, you're never going to have success. So this is why it takes a long time is because you're taking about a tenth at the most since you're heavy cut. You're coming across the entire surface and I only blow your hats. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm doing uh, the magnet, uh, when I'm doing my work. But uh, one thing, when we talk about dressing, here's another thing that you, very important, uh, that you want to do. When you're dressing your wheel, never blink pass on your wheel. One of the worst things you can do because that wheel is going to burn. You're going to, uh, it's, when you go through your finish pass, you go across and that's it. Don't blink pass it back. Your work, Blank pass as many times as you want. When you're dressing wheel, don't blank pass on that because it, it, uh, you won't like the results. It, you're going to have burn marks in the material, and not going to have the proper cutting yet. So, anyway, what I do is I, instead of doing a, surf, a step over, I like to just keep a slow traverse in the Y in a continuous move. Because when I get to my final cut, I'm probably taking less than a tenth off, ripping everything up, and I come across in a slow, Travers, I blank pass, come back, blank pass, and blank pass. I've had it already where I can set a plate on the same size of the magnet and grind it less than a one ten thousandth of an inch with a good magnet like that. And uh, so it is just proper technique. Now, a lot of people, and again, this is a personal preference, if you have a new grinder, you want to start, uh, you know, like with uh, Ron, on your grinder, where your magnet marks, you or set, when you get that thing all set, you might want to take put the magnet off and try to get a nice grind on the surface that the magnet sets. Get that flat to whatever the wear pattern that you have in your machines. And then you turn your magnet upside down and then you grind the bottom of your magnet to get flat. Then you turn it up and you mount your magnet on the surface grinder and you can grind in there. Since I'm only point zero zero five long, you may be worried about it. What's that? Point zero zero five long, you may be worried about it. Uh, it all depends on the accuracy of the parts that you're grinding. If you're going to be using the tip, it falls. So anything better than that is not going to be down the rabbit hole anymore. And then you're probably good. But here's the thing if you're going to grind stuff within five thousand, you're probably good to go. But what's going to happen is say, hey, I want this to be less than a thousand. 
Well, if you had all that work, you can do it. You probably have to go back and, 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 and do something. But yeah, 5,000, you can do that pretty easy, even with a worn out. Right. Said, don't worry about the little digits, the little, that's where they touched off too hard on the middle of the chuck. Yeah, if you've you got little out. spots where they bumped into the, the grinder and that's 20,000 right. feet, don't bring the whole surface down. You're, you're wasting a lot of magnets. You know, just grind and get the majority of it up. There's 5,000 on that one that I have on there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, yeah, a, lot, a, lot of time, a lot of times people will put like WD-40 and they'll put something to spray it before they mount the magnet on. I've had trouble in the past. If I introduce anything that's under the bottom, if there's a bacteria buildup, I've had it already. And I've had this one reason I don't like synthetic consumer is because uh, it seems like I get buildup under my magnet. Just, uh, uh, that synthetic tool. Say, how do you keep the tools from getting under the freaking chuck? Well, that, that's where, like I said, I grind that flat because I'm using the oil-based coolant. It's not getting contaminated with bacteria. I I don't put anything down on my magnet. Mm -hmm. And I can almost guarantee you, and I haven't done this for decades when I pull that off, you might have a few stain spots on there that it, it's going to be good. Now, some people will put different kinds of greases and whatever, and that may be good. But I, in my experience, what I found is I, I can use it for decades without any problem. The problem I've had before, and I don't know, we use other people's grinders, I don't know how good of a job they press the bottom, uh, everything. <clears throat> but it'll, uh, whatever they've done is allowed coolant to come under a lot. But once you get that smell in your coolant, that's a bacteria buildup, and once that stuff starts seeping under, there, now you've got an enhanced bacteria growth because it's sitting in there and it's stagnant. And next thing you know, hey, my magnet's up. You grind your magnet, you true it up, hey, now it's real nice, it's nice and flat. And so for that day, you come over there and it's good. You come back the next day, you grind, hey, this ends up again. Well, that sits overnight, that bacterial grow uh, can, can mess you up. And I've had that at one shop. I, I ground the magnet, got everything good, come back a few days later, well, this is not even close again. Well, you you got to, uh, not the surface of the magnet, where the magnet mounts yeah, to your green. That space in between there. I, the way I use my coolant, the way I use my coolant, oil base, I haven't had the problem. If you get bacteria growth in there, uh, if, if, you know, I use the distilled water now, uh, I use the coolant sock. I, the only time since I've owned that surface grinder now that I ground the bottom, of the magnet as well as what it seats to, I've never had a problem. I can grind my magnet and it will stay good. You know, I, I think I ground two or three times since we had the thing now. And but uh, if you introduce anything under there, what's going to happen is if it's not even, I mean, you're going to want to rub around and get as even as you can, uh, that's going to cause a problem. If you do get a bacteria growth underneath the magnet, uh, uh, is anybody watching uh, John Sanders? Yeah. Did you see that surface grinder he had when he pulled that magnet and you see how nasty and dirty that was? That's all from the bacteria growth. You look at it and your heart sinks. You think, oh man, I got a piece of junk. And he did a pretty nice job on getting that all straightened out. So, but uh, again, I, I don't put anything under there. And again, this is personal preference and opinion. It may work, it may not. Again, it depends on the coolant. If it's getting under there, if you get a bacteria growth in there, you got to get it out. I usually have a practice that I'll pull, probably every two years I'll pull the magnet off and I resurface that bottom and I resurface the magnet and put it on. Now here's another important thing, when you're mounting your magnet, uh, it depends on how you got, some they have the little little nuts that they got on a, you know, that they can tighten your magnet down to your table. If you tighten both of those nuts up tight, you're going to have problems because what's going to happen, especially if you're not in an air conditioned uh, room, this magnet, uh, temperature-wise, is going to be constantly expanding, contracting, depending on uh, the temperature. If both of those nuts are locked down, now you're going to be fighting with the bed material if it's not contracting, expanding at the same amount. You're introducing a bow. Now, now it can expand, and there's a bow, and it cool, it gets under, and it comes down, and you're going to struggle. The proper technique is you want to tighten one down. Again, you don't want to. You, can, you don't have to reap it. When you start working with bolts and you start doing with precision. And you start reefing stuff down, you change. You'll find out just how fluid and rubber-like metal is when you start putting pressure up. But you want to tighten them out so that it's not going to move with the uh, 
forces that you introduced in, uh, when you went. And the other side, you want to go a little bit past finger tight. And what happens on that is to melt the older plate that as that expands, it allows it to slide rather than buckle. So if you do that, you're going to spend less time with your, your magnet. Uh, just again, a little thing you learn over the years uh, that will make a big difference on the finished product you have. Well, thanks guys for checking that out. I hope that was informative for you. Uh, I'm sure some of you that were actually in that class were, were able to watch this and kind of see things that uh, maybe you missed the first go around. And for those people who couldn't attend the bash and, and couldn't get into the grinding class, I hope this was helpful for you. Um, I had a great time listening to Steve and just hear some of his just little nuances about grinding. I don't actually have a surface grinder, but it is a fascinating topic and certainly something I would love to have in my shop at some point. Uh, listen and talk to Stan a lot about his grinding experiences and there's just, there's so much to it and obviously getting things precision is, uh, is what machining is all about. So thanks for checking out the video. I appreciate any likes, uh, comments, or subscriptions if you would. Uh, I'd love to get some feedback from you guys on how the channel is so far. We're just getting started, but hopefully it will continue to get better, both in the production quality and in the type of videos we record. So thanks for stopping by. Uh, for Stiggy and Aaron, it's always sunny in the shop. We're able to, to listen through kind of some of the bumps and sounds and noises. You're going to do that right now. Cats.